Hi, Tiny. Hi. Hi, and I, I, I much rather, for, uh, I, for all intents and purposes, for this call, uh, Siddharth, it's a pleasure to have you on uh, on our um, uh, on the Soul Brew. Welcome to Soul Brews with Shiva, and happy to really happy to have you on Coffee and Soul. Thank you so much for making the time. I'm really delighted and looking forward to this conversation with you, Siddharth. Likewise, thanks for having us on the show. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. So, do you have your cup of coffee ready with you? Yes. All right, great. So I'm going to pour myself mine. I think almost all episodes of Soul Brews with Shiva has the sound of coffee. <laughs> Cheers, Tiny. Cheers. Cheers to health and happiness and to success and all the projects that you are so keenly doing. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, yes. I'm going to ask you, and you know, I will keep flipping between calling you Tiny and calling you Siddharth, because that's, that's, that's the way I know you. So I hope you're comfortable with that. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to ask you to just hold the cup of coffee in your hands, please, and sit back. Can you just nestle it between your palms? Just, just sit back. Hold it between your palms. And if you can just relax with it, yeah? let the warmth seep into your palms. Can you just relax with it? Yeah, all right. Can I ask you to sit back and just breathe and relax? Keep, keep your eyes closed if you don't mind for a few seconds. Interesting to hear what comes to your mind. Anything you see, you know. Uh, I can feel the warm cup of tea in my hands. Yeah. And is there anything that comes to your mind? Any image? Any... Um, what does it make you feel? You can open your eyes whenever you'd like to. What um, does the warmth mean? Relaxed. Relaxed. Yeah. Is that is that is the warmth linked to being relaxed? Is that how yes, it... I think definitely. Yeah, 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 and and uh, um, is is this like it, you enjoy a cup of tea? Like, is this your go-to drink? Yes, yes. Yeah. In yeah. the morning, after getting just before getting ready to, to start work. Uh, what does it do for you? I think it just revives, energizes me, and you know, gets me ready for the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite amazing what these simple beverages can do, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, Tiny, tell me a little bit more about your life. Um, as you as you reflect on all the things that you have done and been through, t tell share with me and my view viewers some of your highs and lows, some of your learnings. Um, well, I'm a development economist, so mm -hmm. I've been working um, for about uh, almost uh, 25 years now in the health and social sector. So it's been great working with different stakeholders, NGOs, communities on the ground. And um, I've grown up pretty much across the world because my father was a banker. So we moved quite often across India, across Africa, uh, and then Europe. Um, so that was a great exposure in itself. It was, I think probably my greatest education was actually that whole experience of traveling and um, being part of so many different geographies and cultures and people uh, and adapting to all the kinds of changes that um, we experienced in different parts of um, the world as you know the world was evolving and um, yeah so I think that was a great experience and I think maybe it inspired also my career path which is you know working in development and um, yeah. So what was, what was the defining moment that kind of pushed you into working in the development world? What was there something, as you said, in your travels and your experiences, was there something you encountered consistently or what was it that drove you to this? I think it was a combination of factors. One was, you know, um, so whether it was in India or Africa, we saw a lot of, obviously a lot of poverty uh, and challenges facing local communities there. But what really impressed me was the, re the resilience mm -hmm. here and there that people have and, you know, how they put to work you know, in the meager resources that they have to actually get things going. Um, that was very inspiring. And then it, I think it made me 
feel that you know, this is really the core where um, I feel excited and challenged and um, inspired to work with these communities and see mm -hmm. you know how I can um, help them and also grow myself in terms of just being exposed to them and you know seeing how dynamic they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so where are you today on this journey? What's happening for you? Um, today I'm actually in a good position because um, I mean, ironically, you know, I think the COVID-19 crisis caused a lot of problems for many people, but um, particularly for the migrant workers, it was a huge challenge, as I think everybody knows, you know, you had um, almost 30 million people move across the country. Uh, just to give you a perspective, you know, in the partition of India, 12 million walked across borders. This is 30 million. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know the gruesome reality of, you know, what made them do what they did and how they are still struggling with it. Um, so anyway, in response to that challenge, I was, I'm based in Geneva, so um, I decided we need to do something. So a group of friends, we got together and we started a volunteer organization, uh, which is today registered as an NGO. It's called Daily Wage Worker Platform. And we seek to actually bring governments, NGOs, civil society and corporates together to support migrant workers with basic food security, which we did during the lockdowns. In the summer with the monsoon, we helped them with an emergency health package using telemedicine and social distancing. And now we are trying to mobilize funds to support uh, 200,000 migrant workers in Bihar, Orissa, Jharkhand, Maharashtra, where you have large amounts of workers there still, um, with a comprehensive package of services to address the root challenges and causes of this daily wage worker and migrant crisis, which is you know, the fact that these workers are largely undocumented. Mm, so yeah, we have you know, no data cards, they have no access to government schemes, they have no knowledge about the entitlements vis-a-vis -vis the government schemes, even with employers, you know, we saw that a lot of them face challenges even, you know, in those, uh, these are daily wage workers, these are migrants who survive on a daily um, wage however low it is mm. for their food, for their health, for their um, rent. Mm. And they didn't get it for one day. They didn't get it for one month. They didn't get it for three months. That's alarming in yes. a country that you know, says that it is a middle income country and we're aiming for self-reliance. Here we have you know, almost 150 million workers according to the 2011 census. Actually, it's probably 200 million today that yeah. are completely dispossessed by you know the pandemic and it's actually civil society that is on the ground helping them so for me that was very exciting because one of the things we did um, because the lockdown people couldn't move anywhere we documented how you know NGO civil society corporates were helping these migrants mm. and it was incredible to see in Delhi in Calcutta and Bombay you know, you had civil society, resident welfare associations, mm. even the police coming out, feeding these workers, giving them rations as they walk 300 kilometers mm. in the heat of summer to reach home. And then when they reached home, it was another tragedy because they faced border security challenges, barricades. Mm. Um, a lot of them were thrown into the shelters where the infection spread rampantly. Mm. A lot of villages were fearful, so they closed their borders to these people coming home. Mm. So it was really a very tragic situation. And I know we were all all so much a part of it. Was well, you 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 spearheaded a lot of it? But when you're talking about the resident welfare associations, etc., and we all kind of pitched in as much and as long as we could to make, to help in the food uh, distribution at least. So it was a traumatic time, and and, and you know you, you 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 the fact that it moved you to start this. How is it going right now? What's what's how, what's the kind of uh, what's the kind of um, um, response that daily wage worker has right now, and what are still your challenges? So we I think we have been blessed because uh, we had. Uh, Shoreview Consulting in Australia, which helped us create the whole online platform in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We also have a strategic partnership with Jindal Global University. Mm -hmm. And they gave us 20 students you know, in April, May to work full time. So all the work that we have on our platform, which is an incredible resource, I'm very happy to say over the last six months that we have developed. Mm -hmm. It has all, a lot of detail about thousands and thousands of pages on migrant workers, their issues, their challenges, 
from the new labor codes to the farm laws, but also a lot of uh, documentation of, you know, who is providing them healthcare during this time, mm -hmm. who is giving them food security, connecting NGOs to donors and partners, um, because you know, as a platform, we want to bring people together to solve this mm. challenge. Mm. And in the course of that, um, as we move from documentation, we realized that the crisis was so acute back in April, we had to get our feet on the ground. Mm. So we started a crowdfunding campaign, a social mm. media campaign, and we raised 50,000 US dollars to feed 30,000 workers in Dharvi. And it was a global effort. You know, we had musicians like um, Ambi Subramaniam, mm. classical dancers, um, the late Asta Debu, all yes. performing. Even yes. New, New Orleans jazz uh, vocalists, you know, lend their voice to the cause. And that's how we managed to raise these funds. We managed to feed 30,000 workers with rations and keep them safe in the RV during that time. Mm. And then as we moved to the monsoon, we saw that, you know, uh, the whole healthcare system was so overwhelmed with just COVID-19. Yeah. No one had the infrastructure, particularly the public health system, to look at non-COVID related diseases and particularly these vulnerable workers. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the idea of an emergency health package. And we targeted 30,000 workers mm -hmm. in three different geographies in Orissa, in Hyderabad and in Delhi in Okla slums. We partnered with three different NGOs uh, Smile Foundation in Hyderabad, Operation Asha in Delhi, and uh, the medics in Angul. Mm. And with the support of the Media Net Network and the Swiss uh, Development Corporation, we were able to get some of these projects off the ground. Mm. We were able to implement this project, which provided, you know, um, very basic healthcare at a very comprehensive rate of one rupee 25 pesa per migrant per day. Mm. Um, and we were able to do screening, diagnosing, giving free medicines, counseling on social distancing, using masks, uh, washing your hands, and also getting the community to adopt, you know, hygiene kits, because this was a very big challenge. Women were not able to, you know, address their hygiene related issues um, because of, you know, the lack of mobility and the lack of funding availability. So this was, I think, a major thrust where the NGOs really provided support to these women, you know, to address their own basic health needs and sanitation needs, which we supported. Yeah. We also did a survey. So, you know, we've interviewed over 3000 workers in these slums to get some very good primary data on, you know, what kind of health challenges they face. What is their health seeking behavior? Because it's ironic that, you know, the poorest of the poor spend all their earnings going to private clinics to get healthcare because the government, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the infrastructure it doesn't work you know and uh, for those reasons mm. they're not able to actually get the help that you know they is due to them mm. to try to address those challenges and then this data also helps both the ngos and the government to get some very concrete data you know on the health seeking behavior the health challenges facing these workers so that they can then design uh, informed and well uh, you know implemented projects to support them okay and so having done sorry no, and, and just saying, okay, hearing all this, what is currently your challenge, your biggest challenge? Because this is obviously ongoing work because the impact is going to be huge and probably felt down the line, even if it's not even felt that much right now, but eventually over time, and one is going to seriously see the impact of this. What are some of your challenges? And how would you like the world to support you, Tiny? We would love, you know, to get some more funding, particularly government recognition for the NGOs. Mm. The Smile Foundation has exceeded their targets in Hyderabad. Mm. So can we use telemedicine to provide last mile healthcare service delivery? A lot of people are looking at that challenge, mm. uh, but we do have a model. It works. So it would be great if other healthcare practitioners, whether they be NGOs, state governments, corporates, the health care community takes up, you know, the lessons learned from our experience and scales it up. And then moving to Rosegar, which is our current project where, you know, as I said, we are trying to provide a package of services to these workers. So what we're trying to do is we identified six very uh, robust NGOs who have collectively uh, fed you know, almost 2 million uh, migrants during the lockdowns, you know, mm -hmm. in their own capacity with their partners. Um, and what we're trying to do in this package is really address the root causes of the migrant worker crisis. Mm. So the first thing we're doing is documenting, 
you know, information about them. There's very little information. So our team has spent six months creating a very robust survey, uh, not only getting the age, sex, caste, and gender, but really understanding what has been the employment history, mm. their experiences working with employers in different states, where are they today? Have they been paid? Do they have passbooks? Do they have ration cards? And also, you know, what are their career aspirations? What are their current skills? What would their kids like to do? So it's, it's a very, very comprehensive survey that we've developed. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, we've already with our NGO partners, literally on a $1 budget, um, done a survey really? of 7,000 migrants mm. in Maharashtra, Orissa, and Bihar. And the results actually show that as of January 2021, the situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. So of these 7,000 migrants, almost 75% do not have jobs today, which means they have no income, they have no livelihood. 50% uh, have ac no access to food, which is not surprising. Mm. That's a large number. 30% um, have no access to basic healthcare services and sanitation. And a lot of people believe that once the lockdowns ended in the summer, the migrant crisis was over and it just disappeared and things no were back to normal. To that that yeah. is not the case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nowhere close to that. Yes, yeah. well, go ahead. So that is one of the things that we're doing, you yeah. know, and now we would wish to scale up this survey. The other thing we're trying to do is actually uh, segregate the workers that come to us. So mm. a lot of them don't want to go back to the cities mm. because of the experiences they've had. So we are connecting them to local government schemes. Mm. We're also educating them about their rights. Mm. So the Jindal Global University Law Faculty has prepared a fantastic kit explaining all the labor codes, the new ones, the old ones, mm. uh, for migrant workers to use in local languages, using um, multimedia campaigns, posters, videos, so we're hoping to really get some support here to actually disseminate this using information technology, which is clearly the way forward, you know, mm -hmm. and um, if we can educate these workers that, you know, they have these rights, they need to have written contracts when they go to employers, no matter what, so that they have some security. Uh, and then these are the five, 10 government schemes that they're entitled to. And then, you know, working with the NGO partners to not only tell them about them, but actually link them to the labor departments, get them enrolled with the data that they require, with all the qualifications that are required so that they actually access those schemes, benefit from it, because there is no point creating awareness without accessibility and enforcement. Mm -hmm. You know, so similarly, what we're doing with the legal part of it is, in addition to uh, educating the workers about their legal rights, we are hoping to create a platform, a network of lawyers from university students to lawyers and paralegals who hopefully will do some pro bono work across the country. So this network really supports these workers in their hour of need. And a lot of the time, you know, they just need basic things like a, a, a kind of official letter, mm -hmm. which is sent on their behalf to the employer so that they get paid. Correct. You know, it doesn't even have to go into big litigation and things mm -hmm. like that. I and then we also want to get these workers to, um, you know, start small enterprises for the people who want to stay back in the towns and cities. So what we're doing is we're working on livelihood opportunities, self-help groups, uh, getting the youth to look at, you know, um, I think the Modi government is talking about the gig economy right now. Mm -hmm. um, so these youth of migrant workers, you know, they can, they all have access to mobile phones, they're on social media. So we're trying to think of innovative ways to really get them, you know, into the ID, IT sector so that mm. they get into the gig economy um, and, you know, empower themselves. We're also looking at, you know, really sectors that have really suffered from this, for example, sex workers, you know, mm. they've lost their livelihood, they've lost their incomes because of the nature of, you know, their ecosystem. Mm. They are worst hit because they never had the right papers and things to get any government schemes. So a lot of them have got into huge debt yeah. and bondage. So yeah. we're also seeing how we can support them. What so a huge agenda. What a huge agenda. And, and, and much, much power to you, um, um, Siddharth, as you go on this journey. I hope, I hope many more people join the cause and support the cause because uh, it's, it's so very worthwhile what you're trying to do. Much after the 
at the uh, it's away from the limelight see daily wages uh, the daily wages uh, as you said after they felt after the lockdown they're back to the cities and they're doing all right and so the focus has shifted elsewhere but to hear the reality and to and to get come to grips with that this is a huge section of our society that is so underserved that unless and until um, there is a sustained effort into making this happen and the way that you are taking it forward even to the sex workers which is again so underserved as a sector it's uh, it's um, uh, it's uh, very very creditable what you're doing and i do hope um, a lot of people are able to support this initiative because it requires that and uh, it demands that of all of us actually uh, in terms of uh, tiny in terms of your life um, is there what have been your key influences in your life what have been some either, either some incidents or some uh, influencers people who have uh, shaped your ideology um i think my parents have played a big role because they've been you know great in, in, in inspiring people because they've done extraordinary things in their own lives and they've also given me space to sort of find my own path in life um one major influence also was um my grandmother uh she was a very avant garde person um who lived life on her own terms and i think you know growing up with her really Sort of taught me a lot in terms of being resilient, in terms of uh, understanding the you know uh, humanity actually, because she was a very humane person, um, and you know she interacted with literally everybody or you know, sort of like multiple people mm -hmm. at any one time and place, mm -hmm. uh, and did very unconventional things. So I think that such really as, influenced me. Such as, can you give an example? Um, you know, like, for example, years ago, we had to stand in a long line in Nehru place to pay the electricity bill. Mm. Um, and there was a long line. And, you know, she just went to the front very forthrightly and said, um, this is where the women's line begins. And everybody was stunned. No one said anything. And she got the bill paid. Amazing. Amazing. So, yeah. And she had grown up, you know, I think in Gandhi's India. So mm. she was very much part of the Free India campaign. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that also inspired my mother. So, you know, you see, she's a big fan of Gandhi's. Yes. Um, and I think it had an impact on all of us. And that sense of, you know, I think freedom and liberation at a personal level, and then, you know, extending it to other people. I think that was something very influential. And that's where I actually see working with some of these people. You, you just see, I think, you know, in India, there is actually a lot. It's, I mean, it is a nation of contradictions. Yes, so yes. there's a lot of oppression and suppression. But at the same time, there's a lot of liberation. You know, you can really go out and do what you want. Um, and just to give you an example, you know, um, years ago, we had gone to um, somewhere in Ahilya Fort in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh. Yes. And we would just stand, we were just taking some pictures. And we asked someone to take a picture of you know, me and my wife. And then um, I said, you know, would you like your picture? So he's a young 15 year old. So he said, yes. And I was, I was about to click his picture and he said, wait. So he tidied up his shirt. He took out a pen from his pocket and he put it inside his thing so it could be seen. And he said, now you can take my picture. I mean, that's the story in a thousand messages there. That, that is, is so I think, the brightness of India. So amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tiny. I couldn't but help come in there because it was, it was, uh, it was just such a powerful picture. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, and then, you know, I was working in the Ganga uh, rejuvenation project. So we did a lot of work in the Hinden River, which is in a mess right now. So we were trying to create a multi stakeholder platform to, you know, get it together. And so I did a lot of field work, you know, going from Sahara and Porto, Mirzapur to all these places. And it was just amazing because, you know, we would be talking to villagers, uh, school children, um, all kinds of local communities. And even if we reached at 11 o'clock at night, they would be there to show us their work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they would insist that, you know, you go and have a meal with them. Mm -hmm. And you'd go into a small hut, you know, and they wouldn't have any food, but they would give you the most delicious rotis and um, yeah, rice and dal mm -hmm. and, you know, make you feel like a king. And then the water would be like even to the extent that it is drinkable, you know, it was also drinkable. And I was like, oh, where are we getting this water from? So it's just our thing just behind the well next to us, mm -hmm. you know, and so there are still those pockets which are still not polluted yes. and so forth. But just that sense of, you know, resilience and generosity of spirit yeah. that you have come to help us but actually you know look at how much we can even in our situation do for you we can at least give you a good grand meal 
it's just very inspiring amazing amazing and what is so what is so beautiful also is uh, siddharth you have the eyes to see you know so i i want to i want to commend you on that because not everyone uh many do many do and i don't want to take away from that but you know to be able to really see the heart of india and to respond to that and to and to and to and to say that if there were enough opportunities where would be we be as a nation with all our people who are so um, who could be so responsive um is there an adage you live by or like a metaphor for life you have uh, siddharth um well I, i you probably know i was in a plane crash so i think that taught me a lot in terms of life how you really you know um need to live as if every day is like your last day so hold on a minute you were in a you were in a plane crash and you speak about speak about it like like i was in greater kailash or something like that so that must have been really something right yes it it was actually my first um well not my first job but my first kind of expedition with the world bank long time ago and we were um, in africa and uh, we were going from one part of ghana to the other and um, this plane crashed and a lot of people died and um, i uh, you know was pretty uh, brutally sort of um, injured i broke a lot of bones and things and it took 6 months to come out of it but during that whole journey i, I think i like lived a thousand lives and learned so much about everything particularly in the development sector because it was quite ironic that you know i had um, gone on an expedition to study traditional medicine in africa mm-hmm. so we were dealing with aids and cancer patients and these healers who said they've treated them using herbs and i i didn't really believe that at the time mm-hmm. and then this accident happens you know and um, it just changed everything because while i was in the hospital there these healers actually came to heal me and you know i was completely i just had a massive surgery and i was in screaming pain and they did actually you know they put their hand on my arm and they said you'll feel no pain where you had this surgery because um and, and that happened for two days i was fine so it just kind of wow. gave me that sense of what the spirit spiritual world can actually do and you know how these traditional belief systems are so powerful and they have sustained civilizations for so long mm. i think you know it's very important to try and revive this because a lot of it is getting lost so that is one of the efforts that we were trying to do um and in that process also you know just seeing how these communities survive you know not only the traditional medicine but even the traditional agricultural practices mm. whether it is africa or even in up you know there was a very interesting project the sode glands project where these um farmers were using you know they had their knowledge of just using neem to get rid of pests Mm. and how they were applying it and you know actually doing a great job before all the you know commercial pesticides and things came into being mm. um so really finding that balance between the traditional and modern worlds and seeing how they can coexist i think that's very exciting for me um yeah yeah and i suppose the all the experiences you had including what you just spoke about and then the healers and the, do you see a, do you see like um you know it's it's really like we all write our own magnum opus in our own ways and it may not be as big as the other persons but it's our own and do you feel yourself somewhere on that journey do you see some threads coming together and how how do you see it uh, siddharth what 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 is happening for you right now if i ask you to just pull out and have a look at this very interesting life what do you see and where is it headed um i keep asking myself that actually <laughs> um but yeah so i i'm really hopeful that you know um the journey that we started with daily wage worker um continues because we've had some really good volunteers um helping us and it's actually amazing because you know a lot of our partners say we have to teach them but then the amount we learn from them is just amazing in terms of their right their creativity their innovation the speed of you know communicating and interacting because you already feel younger you already feel older you know because it's a different generation it, it, it's it's a different way of communicating with each batch so that's very rewarding and exciting and i think for me um going forward you know if we can actually get our ngo forward i think that would be really satisfying and you know if we can get the funding particularly to help these workers mm. that would be very um critical and then eventually you know right now i'm based in switzerland but i'm hoping to come back to india my wife actually um, she's kashmiri she's 
looking to start a farm um, in uh, Kashmir later on. Um, so I think we have a lot of uh, exciting opportunities ahead. Yeah. And I wish you all the very, very, very best to make it happen. Before we kind of close, uh, to the younger ones who are starting out now, is there any kind of a message you'd like to share or give? Sorry. Somebody, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. And I think one thing that COVID has shown everybody is, you know, the chance to reflect, to slow down, reprioritize. And, you know, everybody's Zooming on Zoom these days, which is a good thing probably. But I think a lot of people are spending more time with their families, which is a good thing. Um, a lot of people, because they're not eating out, they weren't able to, they all look healthier for sure. Um, but then I think it's very important. We shouldn't forget about, particularly in a country like India, the other half. You know, um, it's, I, for me, it's very disturbing, you know, to come to the realization that um, literally millions of students of all ages in India today have not been to school for almost eight months. That's one year that they haven't got an education. And what that means is that for one year, they haven't got the midday meal, mm -hmm. which is a big incentive for them to go. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting education. They're not getting food at home. They're not getting that food or education. And as a result of this whole lockdown process, I think a lot of studies came out in November, which showed that you know India has a very, very high um, rate of malnutrition yeah. today, which is very sad. Yeah. So it's, I think it's, it's important that we keep thinking you know, about the other side, um, who have really, really suffered. And again, this is the great resilience of the great Indian nation, that there has not been a civil war, there's not been any anarchy, because you know everybody in Europe keeps saying, if you're really saying that you know 150 to 200 million people have suffered such stark poverty from starvation you know to hunger to being homeless mm -hmm. um, and they haven't like you know there's no sort of like in africa that big revolution that happened mm -hmm. they, they've they've just kind of dealt with it sustained it and come out of it without rebelling without taking on the state you know without overthrowing governments it is actually hats off to them, their resilience and the spirit of India today. Absolutely, absolutely. One last question for you, uh, Siddharth. I believe every individual has a unique stamp and a unique gift to give to, to, to humankind. What is yours? Uh, I'm here, I think I'm yet to discover it. But if you were to think about it, what do you think it would be? I think just you know sharing ideas, getting people excited about whether it is you know a photograph or a project, um, yeah, just creating energy, you know, and taking ideas mm -hmm. into action because so many people have so many ideas. I think it's important to actually take time to implement those ideas, try them out, test them, because and I think this whole COVID experience has taught me and I think a lot of people to spend that time reflect. And you know, think about what's important for them, and then start you know trying it out. Absolutely, right. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I really, really hope that the Daily Wage Worker platform goes places as an NGO. I hope that there is a lot more support that comes to you, people who are listening, hear what uh, what Siddharth is saying, and uh, reach out and. Uh, uh, do whatever you can for the other half that doesn't have a voice, you know, and he has an opportunity to give them that voice, to be a part of making their voice or, or speaking out um, uh, for them till they find their voice. So um, it's a call and uh, I hope we can all respond to it. Thank you so much for, for uh, spending time with me on Soul Brews with Shiba. It was, uh, it was wonderful to talk to you and I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and all the very best to you, Siddharth. Thank you so much, Shiba. I would just request um, your viewers if they could log into www.dailywageworker.com and see our work and um, yeah, support us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.